Welcome to this video. We're going to learn about a circuit called a potential divider, something called a potentiometer, and also about Ohm's law. Let's say we have a circuit that looks like this. There's a battery or a cell. The EMF is epsilon. This is the Greek letter. And the resistance of this one resistor is R1. What happens when you connect another resistor, R2, in parallel with R1, how does that impact the circuit? To answer the question, consider you have a pipe and we're going to send water, we're going to pump water through the pipe. The water goes through the pipe and spills down. What happens to the flow of the water if you take this pipe and you cut out a second pathway for the water to flow through? If you do it that way, then as you pump water through, there are more paths for the flow, and so it flows faster. Here, the water doesn't flow as fast. Here, the water flows faster. The flow is faster simply because you have another path for water to follow. The same thing is true of resistors. It's easier for current, for charges, to flow when there are more pathways, R1 and R2. That means by connecting a second resistor, the total resistance, does it go up or does it go down? The total resistance goes down when you connect another resistor in parallel. What if you take this type of situation but the second resistor has a huge resistance. That's like taking the pipe, and when you connect the second path, the second path is really hard for water to flow through. If the water flows at some speed, then in this second configuration, the water pretty much goes at the same speed. When you add this pathway, you're not really adding anything. The two are no different, because hardly any water goes through that second pathway. The same is true for current. If R2 is huge, then hardly any current goes through it. So if R2 is huge, it's almost like it's not there. The second resistor isn't there, and you basically haven't changed the circuit by adding that second resistor in parallel. Just like you don't change the flow of water by adding this second pathway. So over here, it's no easier for water to flow, and the same is true of the charge in the left side. Let's prove this with the math. The total resistance of these two in parallel is given by this formula. I didn't write R2. I wrote infinity, because R2 is huge. 1 over infinity is 0, and this right side just is 1 over R1. And when you take the inverse of both sides, R total is equal to R1. So, like we said, adding a huge infinite resistor right here does not change the circuit, and you still have, as the total resistance, just R1. So far, we've been looking at parallel resistors. What if we have series resistors? A question you could be asked is, which resistor, R1 or R2, dissipates more of the EMF? In other words, which resistor has a bigger potential difference, V? R1 dissipates a potential difference, which is equal to some fraction of the EMF. The fraction couldn't be simpler. It's just the percentage of R1's resistance. In other words, R1 divided by the total resistance in the circuit. In this circuit, the total resistance is just the sum of the two series resistors. Likewise, the potential difference that the second resistor dissipates is equal to a fraction of the EMF. And what's the fraction? It's simply how much resistance that resistor has relative to the total resistance. Here's a really simple example. This type of circuit is called a potential divider because we're dividing the EMF across these two different resistors. This top resistor 
has 5 ohms out of a total of 10. That means the top resistor contributes 50% of the total resistance and therefore it uses up 50% of the total EMF. The bottom resistor is in the exact same position. What if we make these variable resistors? This symbol here means that you can tweak or adjust the value of each resistor. Well, I want to take a case where I make the top resistor really small. Now, it only will contribute 10% of the total resistance, and so it only uses up 10% of the EMF. The bottom resistor contributes 90% of the total resistance, and so it uses 90% of the EMF. Or maybe I tweak the two values by making the bottom really small. There is a device that allows us to adjust the top and bottom resistances. It's called a potentiometer. We draw it as a box, one big box, with an arrow that's representing a slide. The slide is just a piece of metal that you can move up and down. When you move the slide up or down, it changes the resistance. Moving the slide down lowers the bottom resistance, and moving the slide up raises the bottom resistance. We don't draw the two resistors when we show the picture. We really just draw the single box. We could divide up the resistance, like I've shown here. Moving the slide down does that. Moving it up increases the bottom resistance. Now, what if we wanted to connect another piece to the circuit? Now the bottom resistor has another device in parallel. How do we show that in this picture? We simply draw it like that. The higher the slide, the higher our bottom is. Here, the slide is really high, and the bottom resistance is 9 ohms. Here's a simple case where the EMF is 10 volts. When you move the slide all the way to the top, our bottom is huge. In fact, our bottom is basically all of the total resistance, and our top contributes virtually no resistance. If that's the case, then the bottom potential difference will almost exactly equal the EMF. And what happens if you move the slide all the way to the bottom? Now, our bottom is basically zero, and so it doesn't contribute at all to the total resistance. Therefore, the bottom potential difference is essentially zero. The higher the slide, the higher the potential difference across the bottom resistor. So we can use this to test how devices operate. Let's say we connect some component X to a potentiometer. We move the slide up and down, and what does that do? It changes the potential difference across the bottom resistor and also across X. Because X is in parallel with the bottom, whatever the bottom potential difference is, X has the exact same value of V. So we change the potential difference, and each time we move the slide, we measure how big the current is through X. Some devices will produce a graph like that. The slope is equal to the Y quantity over the X quantity, so current over potential difference. Now, resistance is V over I. That means I over V is 1 over resistance. Devices like this, which have a constant slope and therefore constant resistance, are called ohmic. Some devices aren't that way. You connect them, you move the slide, you measure the current, and what does the graph do? This. These devices, which have a changing slope or a changing resistance, are called non-ohmic. Why do we use those terms, ohmic and non-ohmic? Where does ohm come from? It's named after a scientist. Ohm's law states the resistance of a device is constant, even as the potential difference across the device changes, even as V changes. 
but this assumes that the device is kept at a constant temperature. That's Ohm's law. Some devices at a constant temperature follow Ohm's law. Other devices at a constant temperature don't follow Ohm's law. As you change V, the resistance, the slope, changes.